the turn of the century, the land then known as Palestine was being newly cultivated by groups of fiercely stubborn and idealistic pioneers. They faced disease and endured extreme hardship to bring new life to the soil of this ancient land. Among the early settlers was an agronomist named Aharon Aronson, the discoverer in 1906 of the wild progenitor of wheat. Four years later, with the aid of American funding, he established an experimental research farm just south of the city of Hutton. It was during his fundraising campaign in the United States that he established ties with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which ultimately led to the creation of a binational research program. Since then, such research and scientific development programs have transformed primitive agriculture into a modern and efficient means of production. In 1977, the governments of the United States and Israel established BARC. Today, scientists of both countries are combining different skills and backgrounds on over 300 diverse projects. This collaboration is utilizing knowledge and expertise in an effort to present solutions to the ever-growing demands placed on farmers to produce food. Rapid advances in biotechnology and information technology promise to reshape the practice of agriculture in both countries. research into the long-term storage of grain. Based on knowledge gained from the storage of military equipment, Israeli scientists and engineers have created a portable plastic silo capable of storing up to 500 tons of grain. These structures are designed for the long-term storage of grain surplus and for situations where emergency storage is required. The idea behind integrated environmental control is to conserve the grains without the use of poisonous insecticides. Now, most of the insecticides uh, known to agriculture are, no, uh, are not usable on stored grain because stored grain is in fact already the food that is going to be utilized by the population. Now, the objective of this broad funded research project is to investigate the potential of desert or arid climatic conditions for controlling the infestations of insects in stored grain over prolonged periods. Now what we want to do here is to cool the grain down during the winter season and thereby prevent the development of insect infestations. In addition to this, we hope to be able to um, use the very high temperatures in summer to heat the grain up to above temperatures at which the insects are capable of surviving, a sort of auto-sterilization. These silos are of common interest to both Israel and the United States, since a major amount of the cereal grains are grown close to arid and semi-arid regions in both countries. This is a region where some of the most difficult climatic conditions prevail. Some of temperatures average between 90 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The 400 head milk herd is killed five times a day to conserve the animal's energy. Yet these cows, put under extreme stress by climate and production demands, have been yielding volumes of milk which rank among the highest in the world. Some of these achievements were made possible through a joint research project which studies genetic traits of cattle with the aim of enhancing and improving selected characteristics. The objective of our research was to produce a cow which doesn't only produce a lot of milk, but she gives a lot of milk under very heavy stress. 
Puerto Portland, Puerto de Congress to Bolivia, and then the electricity car, which is very effective, which is an easy car, which grows price, and which improves needs in the UTV. It was really dairy farming system utilizes modern information technology to collect data about each and every cow. Daily milk yields from each lactation are recorded. Activity and health are closely monitored. Every medical examination at time of illness or pregnancy is noted and fed into the cow's computerized biography. Each insemination and calfing is duly recorded. Samples of milk are collected regularly from all the dairy farms in the country. And at the Milk Quality Control Laboratory, these samples are examined for the content of protein, fat, and lactose. This information is then transferred onto computer disks, which are collected and sent to the Animal Genetic and Breeding Research Unit, headed by Dr. Barra Nunn. At the Weizmann Institute, the continuous flow of data is organized for study and analysis. I have really enormous amounts of information. Now our problem is, as this was the objective of the research, how the best way to optimize the use, the utilization of this enormous amount of data for selecting the very best booth which will produce the most efficient total of the future generation. At the Artificial Insemination Center, the analysis of genetic merits is applied towards the annual selection of young calves, offspring of proven bulls and dams, for breeding purposes. The semen is regularly collected for insemination. After a period of four and a half years, during which their offspring are evaluated, only one out of ten of these bulls will prove worthy of fathering the next generation of cattle. Since 99% of the cows are artificially inseminated, the collected semen is carefully examined and evaluated for levels of density and mobility. If these are found to be satisfactory, the sperm is processed and frozen in the form of pellets. The labeled pellets are then used in a carefully monitored breeding program. of cooperation between the two countries were that it gave scientists in each country the opportunity to study data from the other country, types of data that are not available in each of our native countries. And also in the Israeli herds, they are able to collect additional data on a regular basis that we do not have access to in this country. And this opened up new opportunities for us for our research. Tom was one of the more progressive young dairymen in Maryland. He has taken great advantage of the genetic evaluation information that is published. He took over this farm when he graduated from college and has expanded it greatly and improved production tremendously through a combination of more efficient management and particularly by taking advantage of the genetically superior bulls that are available through artificial insemination. Now, the research that's been done by the uh, Animal Improvement Laboratory says that we're making uh, about 200, 250 pounds of genetic progress a year in our cattle, uh, and the rest of it is through management. And so uh, I haven't calculated out what that 250 pounds would be on a whole 500 cow herd, but it's a substantial figure that is uh, an important part of our uh, program. By continuously upgrading genetic evaluation methods in both countries, scientists are increasing the efficiency and health of these animals while raising the levels of production. The future
future generations will be genetically superior, more capable of adapting to stress and increasing production demand. This research is the production of sugars from unicellular red marine algae. These sugars can be used as gelling agents, stabilizers, emulsifiers, emulsifiers, and thickeners, especially in the food industry, but also for other industries, the pharmaceutical fields, and also other biochemicals can also be extracted from this algae. One example is the cyclorotin, which is the red color or the red pigment. Used as a In order to produce this polysaccharides commercially, a biotechnology is being developed which involves the cultivation of microalgae. New techniques are being applied for the extraction of the polysaccharide, or the dye, from the microalgae. Well, the collaboration began in an unusual way. It began as a phone call and have lifted up the telephone and there was a voice on the other end that said, Dr. Ramos, this is for San Andrigio, that we need to collaborate on a project together. Uh, I'll send you the information in the mail and let's begin. Uh, subsequently, she sent a student to me who worked at the main laboratory for about six weeks. Uh, it was at that point that I learned more about her projects. Uh, she came here to the main laboratory for a period of about four or five days where we actually uh, put the research on paper. The fundamental physiology will be performed in this laboratory. That is, there's a technique that can be used to maximize the yield of this hydrochloride. That technology will be transferred in pieces to Israel, uh, and, and Dr. Ayad's goal then is to take that fundamental technology and to scale it up into mass cultivation, economically feasible mass cultivation. There's no question that the route we must take is to go to microalgae, algae which are intensively grown in small packets of land, which are essentially non-arable lands, lands which have a lot of sunlight, lands which are warm, and this is one of the reasons why uh, this project was focused in the Negev Desert. Modern agriculture has become highly dependent on the use of pesticides. But with restrictions placed on some poisonous compounds, such as DDT, new biodegradable pesticides have been developed. Their intensive application has led to a newly created phenomenon called problem soil. Well, in this plot, we grow melons, and as a melon grower, we give uh, pesticides to the soil every year against all kinds of uh, fungi. Especially in this plot here, this year, we had uh, severe damage and the loss of about 40 or 50 percent of the whole crop. So we called on uh, Dr. Katan and uh, Dr. Aronson, and they took some uh, soil samples and found out that we have some soil problems. We are now concentrating in a recent problem of a rapid loss, a sudden loss of effectiveness of certain pesticides. It's what found that in certain soils, these pesti some pesticides are no more effective. And this is due to accelerated degradation. In the American Corn Belt states of Iowa, Wisconsin, and Indiana, farmers have witnessed an alarming increase in crop damage and a severe reduction in yield due to the accelerated degradation of pesticides. American and Israeli scientists are jointly seeking new methods to control and extend the efficacy of these chemical compounds. In order to better understand specific problems, Dr. Donald Kaufman and Dr. Nadal Aronson have been traveling to some of the problem sites. Good, how are you, Bob? Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, I'd like to show you one of the field experiments we've got going. Beautiful thing to see. Big back to the lab. I'd say this corn is a good three feet less in height than what we normally expect. And the best problem was uh, bed this year or 
in general, in particular in this area of the state, uh, the pest problem with respect to corn rootworms was probably greater than average. Um, we had more of them than we usually do. We really think this is the biggest impact on yield when the plants go down like this. You can see that, you know, here's the root system we're dealing with. That's all that's left. This would really represent the worst case situation with corn root worms, and this is obviously when it becomes most noticeable to the farmer who's really lost almost the total root system to, to the corn root worms. I think that's a problem from this developing a real problem field. If you had a real problem field, you, you could easily have, you know, under extreme infestation, most of the plants could look just like this one here. I've been in fields that way in the past, and uh, depending on when the plant lodges, you, know, you can look at probably minimum of 20% yield reduction all the way up to barren ears entirely. No kernel set on the ear. Uh, at all, so you know, we're almost approaching 100 percent yield loss on a per plant basis. First of all, we're trying to identify just what causes this problem, and to do that, we're looking at uh, taking the soil into the laboratory and looking at microbial population, identifying what's there, and just how that pesticide behaves, how it degrades in the soil, and what the microorganisms are doing it, and just how fast. Uh, they are doing it. By uh, using this uh, bar approach, uh, we were able to uh, put together a team of scientists that have uh, similar skills but different backgrounds that were able to attack the problem from a much broader uh, basis. I find it very interesting to apply some of our methods and methodologies that were developed in Israel in a different environment and putting together experience that has developed over several years. And this is uh, some traditional strength to our world and capability really to discuss and to proceed into new areas or uh, into better answers to this quite difficult question. Still a vast and mysterious environment, whose full potential has yet to be realized. Ashore in the city of Elat, at the Oceanographic and Mineralogical Research Institute, scientists are involved in pioneer work in the field of mariculture research. The purpose of the Elat Institute is to develop mariculture, which means using the uh, converting seawater into a means of production, farming marine organisms. Our criteria of choice uh, are divided into two. One is economic criteria, which is the most important one. We look for animals which have very big markets with high prices. And uh, for instance, the domestic is one of them, the same largest prints, as well as the oysters. The second criteria is biological. We look for organisms which will be able to easily withstand the conditions we are going to enforce in them within the maritime population. Now, a major problem related to this project is the fact that when you take the fish out of nature and you put them in captivity, the females do not spawn. The successful commercial cultivation of seawater fish in captivity depends on first creating the means to control and manipulate their life cycle. The research is now concentrating on the use of available fish hormones, as well as on the development of superactive synthetic hormones used to stimulate ovulation and spawning. The potential use of natural and synthetic fish hormones is also being studied at Brooklyn College in New York City. 
the problem that we're looking at here is to find a little bit more out about the basic reproductive plan. What we will be doing is analyzing the structure of the brain and the endocrine system that's responsible for the production of sperm and eggs that are necessary for reproduction to occur successfully at all times of the year. In addition, we will be testing new hormone preparations on our fatty fish, which are freshwater fish, fish that we've been studying for some 25 years in a well acquainted with to evaluate these preparations. The second phase of the project focuses on the rearing and fattening of the fish to commercial stocking size. Nutrition technology is providing the necessary diets needed for the fish at each of the grow out stages. Scientists are seeking new methods to fight the diseases encroaching upon these animals. New technologies are being applied towards creating high density farming systems using revolutionary land based integrated ponds and floating cages out in the open sea. We believe that uh, the technology that is developed here has universal message. There uh, are in places like deserts, like our deserts, that uh, there is hardly any water to do any agriculture or to have any livelihood means. Uh, this is something that will uh, be able to be applied Actually, anywhere in the world, it's the conditions are similar to the ones we're working in. The success of Bard's cooperative arrangement is encouraging scientists in Israel and the United States to seek new methods and technology. By continuing to develop research programs of mutual interest and by sharing their knowledge and expertise, scientists from both countries are increasingly prepared to meet the growing demands and requirements of agricultural food production and to face new challenges as we approach the year 2000.